Hey everyone, welcome. So are we excited about tonight? Yeah. One more time, come on, let's hear it. Let's hear a little excitement. Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is George Bridges. I use uh, he, him pronouns, and I am lucky enough to serve as the sixth president of the Evergreen State College. Um, and I'm certainly honored to um, provide the opening remarks very briefly at this keynote event for the uh, Evergreen Equity Symposium, our annual symposium. It is our tradition, as all of us at Evergreen know, to begin public events at the college, acknowledging the land on which this building and our campus stands. It was originally settled and cared for by the indigenous coastal people of the Northwest, and it was ceded uh, to the uh, federal government in, under the Medicine Creek Treaty in 1854. Um, I specifically acknowledge the people of the Squawks and Island tribe, who are the traditional stewards of the land and pay respect to all members, elders past and present of Squawks and Island people. And finally, I acknowledge and extend that respect to all native and indigenous people here present tonight. Our equity symposium represents, um, in my mind, an integral event, an element of Evergreen's commitment to engaging and advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion on our campus. Evergreen is, as we all know, like our society, a work in progress in these areas and in many others. We seek to ensure that every one of our students, every staff member, every faculty member, every visitor feels welcome, respected, and able to take full advantage of the learning opportunities we have. And I am immensely proud of this symposium. I'm very proud of the many staff, faculty members, and students who voluntarily devoted hundreds of hours to create the symposium and its many events. Our symposium examines and engages many perspectives and issues related to creating a more just and equitable campus, community, and larger society. And I'd like to acknowledge the members of the planning committee. With the members of the planning committee who are here tonight, who put so much time into this, please stand so we can acknowledge your contributions. <clears throat> Thank you. Now everyone knows this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. There's a genius, a genius, behind and in front of the Equity Symposium, and it's none other than my colleague, Dr. Chastity Holloman Douglas, our Vice President for Inclusive Excellence and Student Success. She is a genius, and she has transformed and had a transformational impact on our college in creating dialogues, programs, and policies with an equity lens aimed at one thing, increasing student success. I want to welcome her to the lectern so that she can introduce our keynote. So please give Chastity Holman Douglas, our VP for Inclusive Excellence and Student Success, a warm welcome. Well, good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Chastity Holloman Douglas. I use she, her pronouns, and I proudly serve as Evergreen's Vice President for Inclusive Excellence and Student Success. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I love each and every one of y'all. Don't make me get teary-eyed right now. Um, I am absolutely ecstatic uh, to welcome each of you to the opening night of our second annual Fall Equity Symposium. The theme for our symposium this year is transforming dialogue into collective action. You know, oftentimes in equity work, we get wrapped up in the conversation and the theorizing and philosophizing of, of the issues, but we get stuck when it comes to moving forward and actually taking action. We chose this theme specifically as a way of affirming the importance of dialogue and what it means to share and hear stories of our lived experiences while also asserting the imp imperative to not stop there, but to use those stories to examine our own thoughts and beliefs and make daily actions that dismantle systems of oppression. So I know George stole my thunder, but I'm going to go ahead and bring up my planning team. So there's a group of people I would like to acknowledge uh, and for their countless hours that they dedicated to planning this event. Um, this team was led by a drill sergeant, um, and I'll tell you about that person in a second. <laughs> 
Um, my team, they put, uh, they planned this event with their hearts, with their intentionality, their thoughtfulness, um, and their creativity. So will the following pe people please come to the front, because I want a picture. Meryl Pusey. <laughs> Amira Kaluuya. <laughs> Coley Gladney. <laughs> and August. <laughs> Emily Piper. Makaira Gaines, Jackie McClenney, Javier Womadoff, and our drill sergeant, Hannah Simonetti. You all, let's give them one more round of applause for the work that they contributed to this. Okay, really quickly. So um, tonight's program is a part of the Willie Unso Lecture Seminar Series. As a founding faculty member of the Evergreen State College, Willie embodied the spirit of this institution. Its emphasis on student-directed learning, interdisciplinary programs of learning, collaboration, and personal responsibility. Willie's enthusiasm, his, cel his celebration of his intellect, his kindness and gentle humor, and his eagerness to challenge the status quo are just a few of the qualities that made him a model teacher, mentor, and friend. He, he always dedicated himself to his life's passion and mission, challenging people to treat each other better. The Willie Unsold Seminar is endowed as a living memorial in honor of Willie Unsold. So we extend a debt of gratitude to Willie Unsold and his family. And now for tonight's feature presentation. <laughs> Tonight we, uh, we have the honor of hearing Nikita Oliver. <laughs> Nikita. Hi, Nikita. Woo! <laughs> Nikita is a Seattle-based creative, teaching artist, and anti-race anti organizer. She is an attorney and holds a master's of education from the University of Washington, where she studied racial disproportionality and disparate impact of school in school exclusion. Nikita is a writer in residence and writers in the with the writers in the schools at Washington Middle School. She leads writing workshops with Arts Corp of Garfield High School and is a teaching artist and case manager for Creative Justice, which is an arts-based youth diversion program that provides alternatives to incarceration for youth who are court involved. Nikita is the 2015 recipient of the Seattle Office of Civil Rights Artist Human Rights Leader Award. The 2014, you all bear with me with all these awards. The 2014 <laughs> Seattle Poetry Slam Grand Slam Champion. The 2013, 2014, 2016 Seattle Poetry Slam Women of the World Poetry Slam representative a three-time Seattle Poetry Slam national team member, and she coached the Seattle Poetry Slam national slam team twice. <laughs> yes, she, she, she slams. <laughs> She's open for Cornell West, uh, Chuck D, a public enemy, and performed on the late night show with Stephen Colbert. Through spoken word and images, Nikita Oliver urges a re-examination of both history and the stories we tell. Nikita states, not, not all stories are created equal, some are greater than. Our stories are not told in a vacuum, but rather within the same context in which we live. Our stories also create our context, our inner beliefs and understandings about ourselves and others, and impact how we see the world, live in the world, and treat others. So without further ado, I'd like to extend a warm evergreen welcome to tonight's opening speaker, Nikita Oliver. Good evening, y'all. How's it going? Great. Wow, I'm going to try that again. Good evening, y'all. How's it going? <laughs> All right. All right. 
if y'all would do me a favor and get comfortable. <laughs> Some of y'all were like, yes. <laughs> uh, feel your feet on the ground, if that's where your feet are, or your back in the chair, or your head attached to your body. Hopefully that is in place. Um, maybe feel the palms of your hands, and when you're ready, and you feel comfortable if you wouldn't mind closing your eyes. But don't go to sleep. <laughs> and I want to invite you to take a deep breath and find something from this week that you should let go of and release that as you release your breath. And then when you're ready, take a second deep breath, but allow it to push past where the first breath met and find something levitous, something happy, something joyful, maybe something that made you laugh out loud. And as you release that breath, imagine sharing it with folks in the room Imagine it covering you. And then I want you to take a third deep breath and allow it to fall past the first and past the second. And as you release it, I ask you to invite into the room the people that you come from, your ancestors, whomever birthed you, whomever raised you, whomever you consider to be your family. And while that breath is still in the room, I want you to think about the land that we stand on. Land that is not simply the traditional land of a forgotten peoples, but land that is the present land of those peoples. And I want you to think about the school that you sit in. One of my elders contributed to it, Dr. Mim, so I call her into this space. And I want you to remember all the black bodies that were brought here as stolen peoples and treated as property and used as capital to build these places that we live in. And I invite you to take one more breath and allow it to be a sobering breath that brings you firmly into the present and the here and now for the conversation we're going to have together. And when you are ready, open your eyes. <clears throat> Sometimes it's so confusing living in between, brushing up against what is seen but it's punching me. Though my purpose goes beyond floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee, I know it's hard to see. Warrior blood on the ground, rose of concrete, tear up these streets, our greatest power being naturally. As we are who we be, grow with purpose, we build and we grow for the children we owe. A world we don't know before the seeds that we sow and the tears that we cry water the lost souls of time. Reclaim and reroute in what we know is truth, the blacker the berry. The sweeter the juice, pull from inside more than our skin, it's a culture and vibe. We're on a quest, we come from a tribe. Our hope won't subside, it is the moon and the tide. We ebb and we flow for the purpose of life. To love and be loved, to love and be loved, to love and be loved, to love and be loved. <clears throat> I always start with love. Because the reason we should do this work of equity is out of love. Love for ourselves and love for others, bearing in mind that if you cannot love yourself, you cannot love anyone else. So love must first start with you. The excerpt that I just spit for you comes from a poem or a song called Nia. Does anybody know what Nia means? Purpose. It means purpose. It's one of the seven days of Kwanzaa here in the, U in the United States, 
where black folks who were stolen from our motherland and brought here created so we could remind ourselves and our children of our purpose and our culture and our heritage. So I always start with Nia and start with love because I deeply believe our purpose is to love. Now I don't think of love as that gushy love and this is coming from somebody who's watched every B and C list romantic comedy available uh, from Hollywood, Bollywood, Netflix and Hulu <laughs> and cannot wait for the holiday season to start because all of the like sappy, romantic comedy, holiday movies are about to come out. And I'm excited. I literally went to see Last Christmas last weekend. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> but that's not the kind of love I'm talking about. I'm talking about <clears throat> the kind of love that turns on the lights when you've been in darkness. What happens when you turn on the lights after you've been in the dark for a long time? Your eyes hurt. Your eyes hurt. Your eyes hurt. See, we've made the mistake of thinking that any sign of pain means bad. I'm a boxer. Yeah, you are. Knock out Yeah. Because <laughs> if, if pain meant bad, I would have stopped boxing a long time ago. But sometimes when you're training, and your muscles are getting stronger, and your body's learning new movements, there is a bit of pain. When we come from an inequitable place, and we're learning new movements, and the lights are turned on fresh, there is a bit of pain. There's also probably a sense to freeze, fight, or flee. This is something I've learned in the boxing ring. The moment somebody throws that first punch at you, your instincts kick in. My instinct used to be to go like this. You can't do that in a boxing ring. You're gonna hit some ropes. <laughs> you also can't freeze. And you also cannot fight wildly. That's how you get knocked out. Y'all mind if I start with a, a poem about boxing? Yes. All right, I'm gonna borrow that one more time. Sometimes I need my hands. <laughs> when I tell people I'm a boxer, they almost always ask me the same three stupid questions. <laughs> One, do you get hit? <laughs> Two, does it hurt? <laughs> Three, but, but do you ever bleed? And I'm thinking, duh, it's boxing. Have you ever seen a match where someone doesn't get hit? But my mother raised me right. I'm polite. <laughs> I say, yes, I get hit. Sometimes it hurts. And every now and again, I bleed. And they go, because oh. see, most people are afraid of blood. Most people are afraid of seeing blood. Most people are most afraid of seeing their own blood. So I tell them, this is not the first time I've held my own blood in my hands. Watch the red droplets pull after a string of fighting words that smash hard against my face. I'm learning. Boxing and life are really not that much different. My coach keeps telling me, Nikita, you gotta learn how to keep your eyes up. But truth is, I still haven't figured out how to keep my head up. So as coach cleans me up, I stare at the carnage, settled in the folds of my flesh, the looking glass in my family tree. And I'm thinking, dang, is this all that I'm made of? Now see, Muhammad Ali said, y'all do know who the champ is, right? <laughs> all right. Muhammad Ali said, if they can make penicillin out of moldy bread, then they sure can make something out of me. So tell me my body, my blood, what I'm made of so I can know exactly what I could be made into. Spare me no record of wrongs that I might not become a broken record. 
repeating my family's history time and time again. Let me open every closet in this house because I am sure there are more closets in this house for me to hide my own skeletons. Tell me about my mother's father, how he liked white sheets in the dark of night, his cross set ablaze and burning in the eyes of little girls that look no different than me, how he liked his bottle empty and his woman silent. Tell me about my mother's mother, how she raised herself up, how she built herself up a broken house around my mama. Show me my mama, little girl huddled in a corner on a tear drenched floor beneath a roof too holy to shelter her from the downpour of belts and hands. Tell me about my father's father. Tell me a story of backbreaking work and empty stomachs filled to the brim with Negro spirituals. Let me hear my Baba, my father's mother, sing our spirituals. She be like, <clears throat> wait in the water, just wait in the water children can you hear her singing how she raised her children up high above corn cotton taught them to flee the fields of louisiana for the rubber factories of indiana show me the glint of promise on their brows as the hearts beat hard against rubber flex melted down to once again be plow and ox let me feel how cotton Plastic, feel no different against your palms when your bootstraps still refuse to fit this so-called American dream. Please show me just one dream, how black and white have always been the making of a classic movie. Show me the stars in my parents' eyes when they found out they were gonna have this sweet but sick little baby and my father, so used to fleeing danger. He cannot figure out how to stay firmly put. Teach me how to stay firmly put. Remind me I am a boxer, I am a fighter, that there is no rot or rust or mold that I I cannot transform that rot, rust, mold have been made into medicine. Remind me that I am my own medicine. I am my own medicine. I am my own medicine. So you, you who also have rot, rust, and mold, you too are your own medicine. And together we are the greatest medicine we could ever need. So in addition to love and purpose, <clears throat> I wanna talk about medicine. Uh, and to be completely transparent, food and stories and ritual as medicine is something that I gained from my native teachers, from folks like Matt Rimley, from the Standing Rock Sioux, Rachel Heaton, uh, who's a part of the Muckleshoot and Duwamish, uh, and from Mitzi Longearth. Who, who's part of the Plains peoples. These are people who have taught me that our stories heal. So knowing, learning, preserving, telling our stories is incredibly important. So before I go too far forward, I have to tell you a story of something that happened to me this week because I would feel like I failed if I didn't. I go and I speak at schools all over the United States. <clears throat> And I go speak at equity summits and race and justice summits and social justice this and social justice that. And inevitably at so many places, I get emails from people there who tell me about how their school ain't acting right. And sometimes the schools ain't acting right. And sometimes the schools are trying to act right, but they're not getting it right yet. So I received an email this week from a student on your campus articulating to me that they were feeling invisibilized. And in particular, this is a native student. And I bring this story here in this moment because I am fortunate and also responsible enough to have a platform. So I'm gonna read to you the beginning of what this student was going to say to you. Good afternoon. I am a member of the Nez Perce Tribal Nation, a two-spirit person and an evergreen senior studying in the Native Pathways program. To open our time together to address the sacredness of the space between us and hopefully to narrow it a little bit, I will begin by leading us through a ceremony I created just for this occasion. The purpose of this ceremony is to open the mind and heart to contemplation through confrontation with some difficult truths in order to facilitate dialogue 
positive change and healing. I will guide us slowly, mindfully, and deliberately through a series of questions arising from a unifying indigenous theme of relational accountability. I must ask of the people gathered here to observe some ceremonial protocol. Please hold your place in your silence until all questions have been asked. This means cell phones and devices muted or off. This is not a social media type moment. Just try to be fully present and hold it in your memory. And please understand that at the heart of this ceremony is the issue of academic harm to indigenous students. There is a weight here, an emotional content, and a deeply spiritual underlying element. So I ask to please respect that, to prepare for it prayerfully in whatever way you choose and open yourselves to be transformed by it or to exclude yourself in this space if you are uncomfortable. The first question was, do you know that you've disenfranchised, marginalized, othered, and hurt me? I'm not gonna read all of the questions, but I wanna put that into the space. When a student takes the time to find every single email address I'm connected to, <laughs> and I'm not kidding, y'all, I work for the Seattle People's Party, the email address there, my email address at work, my, all of my personal email addresses, uh, which is fine. Actually, it's great. Um, I take it very seriously, because that means there is a very real need to be seen and to be heard. When I went to Seattle Pacific University, <clears throat> I was a student that always spoke up. I was a student that professors were terrified to have in class. I was a student that they didn't want to say anything to, but they would tell their colleagues they were terrified to have me in class. I was a student in law school where a professor literally told me she would not talk about race in her class because she was afraid that I would call her out. But I didn't know what else to do in a space that I felt like was consistently ignoring the peoples that I come from. So I bring this up because I'm sure there's at least 10 other students who feel the same way this student did or does, but aren't the ones that speak up or didn't know what would happen if I got their email or if they even wrote me. I always wanna start opportunities to speak from a space of mindfulness. That there are people in the room who feel invisibilized, who feel like their story doesn't matter or their voices are not heard. I also want to say the fact that y'all are having this equity summit in light of some of the things that happened a few years ago, show your tenacity and your resilience to continue to engage this conversation. And I want to push you to engage action on it even further. Word? Word. Cool. All right, y'all got so quiet on me, it felt intense. So I really hope that this in encourages the folks that are here to pay um, some close attention to some questions about how our Native students feeling on this campus, how are Native professors feeling on this campus. One thing I noticed in the students' questions was that there are, according to the way they're experienced, there's no full-time faculty focused on Native youth. So I don't know if that's true, but that's a need. Word, you can take action on that like tomorrow. <clears throat> Everyone take a deep breath with me. There's no greater agony than bearing an untold story within you. So today my goal is to encourage everyone to first and foremost explore your own story. Who are you? Where do you come from? What does that bring with you into any room that you're in? Y'all know the word intersectionality, I'm hoping. Intersectionality was created by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, the goal of which was to explain what it means when people have intersecting identities, especially those who have intersecting identities that are oppressed. Because oppression, when your identity is intersecting, interse woo, intersecting, not intersecting, don't do that, y'all. <laughs> when, when that's happening, it's a compounding experience of oppression. This came up because there were women black women in particular, who wanted to get jobs in factories. And so they filed a lawsuit. 
And the factory said, well, <laughs> we're not racist or sexist. We have white women, black men, and white men. We're totally not racist or sexist. No, that's called misogynoir. It's racism and sexism against black women. So Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw wanted to create a way for us to be able to thoughtfully talk about intersectionality. I also take this to push me to think about intersectionality on the privilege front. Some of us in this room have intersecting identities that have privilege, which means our privilege is also compounding, which means we also have now the compounding extra visor. You know like how horses wear sometimes to keep them in a straight line? Some of y'all got really big ones of those and are walking in an extra straight line. So our goal is to get you to take those off, or my goal is, by thinking about your story. Story is a super powerful thing. Story is like air. How many of y'all like breathing clean air? I love breathing clean air and drinking clean water, so shout out to our water protectors. Stories, like air, if they become polluted, pollute everything around them, including the people taking them in. And many of us, for majority of our lives, have been taking in polluted stories. If you took a history class, I am absolutely certain that they did not paint a picture of Native people, unless you went to a very great school, uh, of Native folks that shows Native people as resilient or shows that Native folks had very complex trade routes in the United States, or what should be called Turtle Island, or that Native folks had lots of ways of protecting the environment that were agreed upon and understood. And yet, when white Southern colonials came, they said that Native people were what? Savages and uncivilized. That is the story we get taught. It is not the truth. I also got taught in my horrible Pike, uh, Indianapolis Pike High School education that Native folks scout people. I found out by reading Roxanne Ortiz Dunbar's book, it was actually the other way around. Scalping got brought to Turtle Island by Europeans. It was a tactic of mercenaries over in Europe as a way of scaring people when they were fighting for a particular country. So we not only get fed polluted stories, but we get fed entirely untrue stories. And then we tell those stories to our children, and our children's children, and our children's children, and they get written down in textbooks where they tell us that black folks immigrated here. So we have to be very thoughtful about story because story creates our culture, it creates our identity, it creates the way we engage with people. So for me, when we first start talking about equity, I wanna tell stories. I literally wanna sit in rooms with people and I wanna hear how your family taught you about you. I wanna hear what story you think of when you think of yourself. For a long time, as I was growing up, I can't, I'm almost ashamed to tell y'all, this is what I read in elementary school. I read every single book of the Babysitter's Club. Nice. <laughs> so in my head, when I imagine myself, sometimes I imagine a little white girl. To my shock, I look in the mirror, it's not a little white girl with blonde hair that can like a comb can nicely go through. So even the stories we read and we teach our children that we give them to read can affect the way they see themselves, the way they see other people, the way they interact with people, because that's the image we give folks in their heads. Words, I'm a lawyer and a poet, words create our reality. So here are the four parts of story. A story is a vessel for information. A story creates an emotional connection, which is why I love Beelis romantic comedies. Stories create our cultural identity, and stories are entertaining. So I'm gonna tell you a story. I want you to imagine two folks a thousand years ago, but I'm gonna call them Brian and Kevin. I don't think that was their name a thousand years ago, but that's my name for them. Brian and Kevin are uh, traipsing through the brush. They're looking for food, like they do every day. But all of a sudden, they hear 
a snap, like a twig snaps. And then they hear something running through the brush. And, and Kevin is like, oh, no. Nah. And Kevin runs. Kevin finds a tree, and Kevin climbs up in it. Brian, on the other hand, froze. Remember I told you fight, flight, freeze? He froze. And Brian gets ate. Ate all up. Brian is gone. Kevin stays up in the tree until he thinks the thing that ate Brian is gone. Kevin comes out the tree, and he goes back to the village where he lives. And he's like, y'all, Brian is gone. Something up in the brush ate him. I heard a twig snap, and I ran, and I climbed in a tree. So the people are to realize, OK, if we're out in the brush and we're looking for food and we hear a twig snap, we should run and climb up in a tree. It might not be the thing that ate Brian, but at least, you know, I've got a chance to stay alive. So people start doing this. This is their way of protecting themselves when they're out looking for food. Over time, things change, and Brian and Kevin's peoples start growing food closer to home. So they don't have to go out and look for things as often. And they keep, but the story keeps getting told around fires and late at night. And they make up ideas about what was the thing when the twig snapped that ate Brian. And people get scared. They love to tell this story. In fact, they start a festival. It's a tree jumping festival. Everybody runs as fast as they can and jumps in a tree. It becomes a rite of passage. If you can't do it, you're not getting the rite of passage. You're not getting your little, your badge, okay? You are not an adult. You gotta know how to run and climb in a tree. And people keep doing this. It, it becomes like a fun thing to do in 2004. Like, people go out and they do it the way they do these weird triathlons. They run, they jump, they climb in a tree. They don't know why, but they still do it. People get prizes for it, win $1,000, train for it all year. And this is a tradition that has continued on into 2019. I made this story up. <laughs> no. I feel like you might be able to find some things that are true about it. Here's, here's the point of the story. First off, the story became a vessel for information. Kevin was able to go back to his folks and be like, hey, look, if you hear a twig snap, it might be the thing that ate Brian. You should run and climb in a tree that saved my life. It became what people did. It also got people to have an emotional connection. You know, they, they could tell each other the story, like, I feel good because I just maybe saved your life. And it created a cultural identity. They started a festival around it. They told it at night. Uh, people still do it in 2019. It became a part of their culture and their identity. Um, and lastly, entertainment. I don't like horror movies, but people do. <laughs> so there's a reason why they like to tell this story around the bonfire late at night and scare little kids. Not my idea of a good time, but some people like it. <laughs> Stories have the ability to do all of those things, and sometimes we don't realize it. So for example, I live in Seattle, Washington, where my neighborhood is rapidly gentrifying. There are people on my block who lived in their house for 30 years. Young man tells me a story that he's coming to visit his grandma. He knows where the key is, the hide a key because his school's not that far away. He's looking for the hide a key. He walks into grandma's house. Five minutes later, police knock on the door. This young person is black in a neighborhood that is slowly becoming whiter and whiter. The white folks in our neighborhood have been taught to fear certain things. It was handed down as information. There's an emotional connection it has become a part of their cultural identity. And to be honest, some of y'all in here watched Get Out and thought it was fun. I watched Get Out and I was terrified. I'm honest, I didn't leave the theater for 20 minutes. That movie was traumatizing. The end when the, the white girl is being held down after she's like tried to kill hella people, she sees the cop car and she's like, <laughs> you about to get it. That was traumatizing to me. Because there are some white folks who called the police knowing that police will believe them over any brown person at the scene. 
So understanding the way stories work can help us understand how certain ways of seeing each other, how white supremacy, racism, classism, sexism and patriarchy, xenophobia, Islamophobia, have been handed down through storytelling. Look at our news. I remember during 9-11, seeing the images of Muslim people and the stories that were told. Yet at the same time, no one was talking about how the United States had been in many other people's homelands for a very long time, inflicting fear and terror upon them. The story is also often one-sided. Understanding the way stories work have, has helped me learn how to ask key questions, like what's going on here? Where did it come from? How do I dismantle it? But also, how do I unlearn it? We have to unlearn things like white supremacy and internalize oppression. We have to unlearn things like patriarchy. I mean, the US Constitution uses he, him, and man as if all of us are he, him, and man. Some of y'all in this room have friends who use they, them pronouns, and you mess it up. You're having to unlearn things and learn a new story. Once you learn that new story, those new things, those real things, those equitable things become much easier. I'm gonna play a story for you. Some of y'all learned this story a long time ago. How many of y'all know um, Goldilocks and the Three Bears? Who knows where they learned that story at? A public school. Anybody, raise your hand if you remember exactly who told you this story. Raise them high. Okay, so like seven of you <laughs> know exactly who told you this story. I want you to watch it closely. The story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Goldilocks. She went for a walk in the forest. Pretty soon, she came upon a house. She knocked, and when no one answered, she walked right in. At the table in the kitchen, there were three bowls of porridge. Goldilocks was hungry. She tasted the porridge from the first bowl. This porridge is too hot, she exclaimed. So she tasted the porridge from the second bowl. This porridge is too cold, she said. So, she tasted the last bowl of porridge. Ah, this porridge is just right, she said happily, and she ate it all up. After she'd eaten the three bears breakfasts, she decided she was feeling a little tired. So, she walked into the living room, where she saw three chairs. Goldilocks sat in the first chair to rest her feet. This chair is too big, she exclaimed. So she sat in the second chair. This chair is too big too, she whined. So she tried the last and smallest chair. Ah, this chair is just right, she sighed. But just as she settled down into the chair to rest, it broke into pieces. Goldilocks was very tired by this time, so she went upstairs to the bedroom. She lay down in the first bed, but it was too hard. Then she lay in the second bed, but it was too soft. Then she lay down in the third bed, and it was just right. Goldilocks fell asleep. As she was sleeping, the three bears came home. Someone's been eating my porridge, growled Papa Bear. Someone's been eating my porridge, said the Mama Bear. Someone's been eating my porridge, and they ate it all up. Who leaves the bowl the upside bear. down? Someone's been sitting in my chair, growled the papa bear. Someone's been sitting in my chair, said the mama bear. Someone's been sitting in my chair, and they've broken it all to pieces, cried the baby bear. They decided to look around some more, and when they got upstairs to the bedroom, Papa Bear growled, Someone's been sleeping in my bed. 
Someone's been sleeping in my bed too, said the mama bear. Someone's been sleeping in my bed, and she's still there, exclaimed Just Baby Bear. Smiling. Just then, Goldilocks woke up and saw the three bears. She screamed, help, and she jumped up and ran out of the room. Goldilocks ran down the stairs, opened the door, and ran away into the forest. And she never returned to the home of the three bears. The end. Well, I cannot believe we, we teach children this story when I thought about it. <clears throat> All right. Goldilocks walks up to a house that isn't hers. Knocks on the door, no one answers, and she just walks in. I'm a lawyer. I work with kids in the criminal legal system trying to help them get free. She just broke and entered. Now, I'm not advocating that we call the police, but I'm just saying, she broke and entered, and nobody bats an eye at it. She continues on her, on her way. Also, somebody explain to me why a little white girl is skipping through the forest by herself. No one thought that was unusual. Like people call CPS on, on little children at the park alone, let alone skipping through the forest. Anyways, I digress. So she's just entered the house without permission. There's food on the table and she's like, I'm hungry, I'ma just eat it. She tries every bowl, eats the last one. And then in this video, they have the nerve to leave the bowl upside down. Goldilocks has no manners, didn't even put it in the sink. Then she's like, I should sit down. Goes up in the spot and sits down in all the chairs and breaks the smallest one. Malicious mischief. <laughs> okay? She's just racking it up right now. She might need to come to my program. <laughs> then Goldilocks is tired. She's broken entered, she's broke a chair, she ate all the food, she got the itis. Okay, and then she decides she should take a nap. She tries every bed, and it doesn't even say she took her shoes off. <laughs> she climbs in the bed with her shoes on. Oh my goodness. And then she stays there, finds a bed that works for her, and she's, she's asleep. And the three bears come home. They're all like, oh snap, the door is open. Did we leave the door open? That's what I would have thought, because sometimes I'm in a rush leaving the house. I've left my keys in the door. That's on recording, never do it again. <laughs> so, you know, they probably, you know, maybe they question themselves. I'm reading the subtext here. They go in the house. Now they know they didn't eat the food because they left it there to cool. They see the chair is broken. They see their beds are all messed up. And then Goldilocks is in the, be in the bed and has the nerve to run away scared. We teach this story to children. We call the main character Goldie Locks. She almost always, actually I've never seen a brown Goldie Locks. She always has white skin, blue eyes, and this blonde curled hair. We're literally teaching it's okay for white folks to do this and then that brown folks can't be mad about it. Some people will say I'm reading too deep into this. Let me tell you why I don't think so. The original story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears was actually about three bachelor bears. It was a poem. It was an oral story first that later got written down. And it was, in, it was over in England, over the pond. And they tell the story, and it's not Goldilocks in the story, it's an old silver-haired woman. And everybody knows that there's three bachelor bears living out in the woods, and most people don't go mess with them, but the silver-haired woman goes and knocks on the door and is like, yo, let me in. And they're like, no. And then she's like, no, let me in. And they're like, nah. So then they like go out and she goes in. And then they come back and the story ends with, you don't know what happened to the silver-haired woman. The point of the story is, if folks is like, don't come in my house, don't go in the house. <laughs> Especially not three bachelor bears. But the story then gets written down. The, the research that I've done says that an auntie wrote it down for, some, some, for her nieces and nephews. And 
the story starts to change from the original oral story. And as it makes its way to the United States, not only does the story change the Goldilocks and the Three Bears, but it's given images. And the images look a lot like the ones we saw in this video. Maybe not as cartoony, they were like kind of real art first and then cartoony art. Um, and you start to see the way the story shifts. As you add images to it, the image of who was in each role begins to shift. And in the United States, when you read police reports of folks who have been shot by police, they say they looked what? Suspicious? Threatening. threatening, what kind of threatening? Like a monster or animal-like. So then you think about the fact that this story has shifted so much from its original story. Almost everyone in this room knew the story and only like seven of you knew where the story was told to you. Now I'm not gonna say that people who rewrote the story did it on purpose because it was like their grand master plan for white supremacy. But I do think white supremacy made its way into the way that the story got told and the images that got attached to it. And then it becomes a part of our culture, becomes a part of the way that we see people, becomes a part of our interactions and this is literally something we teach very little people. I always challenge people when I share this, imagine if the story had ended differently. Imagine if Goldilocks had fled and the, the bears like made a post on Facebook. Yo, someone who looks like Goldilocks ate up all our food, broke our chair, and then Goldilocks' parents see the Facebook posts and they're like, Goldilocks, you gotta go apologize and you gotta fix the chair, and you gotta play with baby bear, and you gotta mow their lawn for a year. What if there was some sort of relational accountability attached to the story that required Goldilocks to account for her behavior and humanize the experience of the bears? How terrifying would it be to have someone in your house break your chair, eat your food, and then still be sleeping in your child's bed? And then we tell the story like, that's okay, that's Goldilocks. But we do this. I work with young people in the criminal legal system where when young black children take things, it's like the worst thing that's ever happened in the world. And when young white kids come into court, they're automatically offered diversion like, that's cool, it's just a Gucci purse. Which it is just a Gucci purse. My wish is that every kid got the opportunity to be heard out as to why they made those decisions and offered a diversion into restorative justice. But that's not the world we've set up with the stories that we tell. <clears throat> so we make stories normative. I love teaching sixth graders. Sixth graders are the craziest thing ever. They're like the best thing that happened to me. Sixth graders laugh at words like poop. <laughs> I'm serious. I have them do this fast five poem about their shoe and this kid wrote a poem about a shoe stepping in poop. And as soon as the young person said the poem, the whole class erupts <laughs> into laughter. So in that same classroom, I have this young person who I'm going to call Rio. Rio is hilarious. Rio never sits in Rio's seat. Rio has drawn dinosaurs in every folder in my classroom. So when I open them, oh, dinosaurs, Rio's been here. Rio spins around in class. It drives other teachers crazy. What I've discovered is when Rio is doing those things, Rio is listening. Because let me say five plus one is four. Rio will immediately raise Rio's hand and say, no, it's not, it's six. I quickly realized that Rio has to be moving to pay attention. So how do I create a classroom where Rio can move and learn? Rio's mom calls me about three months into teaching Rio and tells me, guess what? Rio was diagnosed with ADHD. It's such a relief. Rio's gonna be on medication. Rio starts coming to my class and sits in Rio's seat. Doesn't draw dinosaurs anymore. And never corrects me when I do the math wrong. 
So all the students in the classroom lose out because their teacher sucks at math and Rio is no longer the same Rio that they were before. In all of Rio's other classes, they're almost immediately kicked out of class. My class was the only one that had absolutely no times when they were kicked out. It became normalized that Rio was the bad kid because Rio couldn't sit still. And it is normalized in our school system that if you give young people who don't sit still medicine to make them sit still, then you've done the right thing. Rio stopped writing. Rio stopped talking. Rio stopped drawing. Rio stopped bringing in homework. So guess what? When Rio started spinning around in my class again, I celebrated. I was excited. Other teachers were like, oh my god. They're moving every time I speak again. They'd be in the, the staff lounge just losing their minds. And I'd be like, oh, Rio was great in my class. Rio started doing homework again. Rio started drawing dinosaurs again. And Rio left my class with an A. I usually do a poem to tell that story. Mostly because poop is hilarious and y'all laugh when I say it. <laughs> the point of that story is to get us to also rethink in moments where we're not even realizing we're applying things. How many of y'all are gonna be school teachers one day? Some of y'all are like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm at Evergreen and I got an experimental undergraduate degree. <laughs> I wish I went to Evergreen, y'all. It's, <laughs> it's not too late. <laughs> 35 and going back to undergrad, yes. Uh, my mom would kill me. <laughs> Thank you. My mom would be like, you have a law degree, please stop it. <laughs> we normalize things through story, and then we normalize them into law, and we normalize them into medicine. And we create, create all these instances where we think what we're applying is accurate. We teach people that they are wrong because of how we expect other people should be. I'm gonna finish with this story and then do a poem. A dandelion is a weed or a flower. Weed or a flower. All you third people over here, I don't wanna hear you right now. You were told it was a weed. Someone said it's a flower, someone said it's food. Y'all say it's medicine. I'm actually really excited about this. This means our norm is changing. When I used to first bring up dandelions, people would always say, weed. Dandelions are amazing. We've labeled them a weed. We've told a story about them. People who have yards hate them. But we cut the grass, and that's why we have so many dandelions. You know how I know that? Because I've read about it. When you cut the grass, you make the grass lower, which means the dandelions get more sun, which means their roots can grow deeper and they're harder to get rid of, and then they can take over your whole yard. So stop cutting your grass. <laughs> no more manicured lawns. Also, dandelions are wonderful because they show us what we should be like when we're talking about collective action for equity. If you pull up a dandelion, it's going to come back with three, four, five, ten of its friends. When something inequitable happens and someone comes and tells us about it, they should be able to go back with three, five, ten of their friends. When you're in a class and something happens that is not acceptable, there should be three, five, ten of your friends calling it out. When I was in law school, we used to go back and forth over G-chat and be like, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about dandelions is they can be food. Dandelion greens are bomb. They're also good for you. They detox your body. It can be made into teas and tinctures. The roots can be made into teas and tinctures. What we've labeled a dandelion as when we call it weed is our problem and not the dandelion's fault. Dandelions are beautiful. They have long stems for the express purpose of being able to reach the wind so that when all those little florets, florets, yes, because each yellow leaf on a dandelion is actually one flower. It's a floret. 
So it closes at night and opens during the day. And then one night it's, it's going to close and it's going to open and it's going to be seeds and it's going to reach its stem up as high as it can to reach the wind. So the seeds catch and it blows all over your lawn. <laughs> I think they're flowers. I think they're medicine. I think they're amazing. I think they've been labeled a particular way. This is the other thing stories help us unpack. They help us figure out who we are. They help us understand culture. They help us understand things that we've normalized. And they help us figure out why we've labeled a thing the way we've labeled it. And when we understand that story, give us the capacity to rename it and give it new power. The things that we name something, what we name a thing, gives it power, gives it the ability to control things or be controlled. It makes it a target. When a dandelion is a weed, it is a target. When a dandelion is a flower, it is something to protect and guard. When a dandelion is medicine, it is something to cultivate. So what you call someone or something determines how you will or will not interact with it, protect it, care for it, or cultivate it. <clears throat> Let's go down to the river to pray, studying about those good old days and who shall wear the golden crown. Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, family, let's go down. Let's go down. Don't you want to go down? Oh, family, let's go down. Down to the river to pray. I can hear my auntie in the back of the chapel singing. My Baba leans over to me and she says, baby, let's go down to the river to pray. We make our way down the mountainside into the valley below. She tells me this is the place where the water settles in the place where it's most needed. And you must learn to settle in the place where you are most needed. She tells me, look how water moves. Look how it starts in the sky, makes its way down the mountainside into the valley below. It will not be stopped by anything. Watch how water moves over, around, or through a thing if it has to, and you must learn to move over, around, or through a thing if you have to. She said, you must understand that your body and water are one and the same thing. Your body and water and justice are one and the same thing, so watch how water moves over, around, or through a thing if it has to. Because justice is just us being just us. Without us, there is no justice. And just in case I wasn't listening, she peers deeply into my eyes and says, justice is just us being just us, without us there is no justice, without us there is no resistance, without us the system persists in its defiance, dividing us further from the divinity that is our unity with our mother, dividing us further from the divinity that is our unity with each other. That's when cash rules everything around me as the man is steadily auctioning off stock in my body, blocking these attempts to break free. Understand there can be no fair trade agreements when black bodies are still sold as stocks and bonds and jail cells sell out as politicians are building their wealth on these black and brown bodies. Markedly marketed, targeted, murdered extrajudiciously with impunity, not just locally, but globally by the same hands that stole my people from our homelands, by the same hands that brought us to someone else's homelands, by the same hands that'll sell us back our homelands overprocessed and overpriced till we become underfed. But yo, 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 I come from a resilient people. I still living people. I still hear people in land of the brave, the home of the slave. Shit, I keep getting that wrong. The land of the Braves, the home of the did anybody else ask why we've made the Braves amongst us invisible? Why we don't tell their stories? Why the rivers round us run red with blood? See, we don't ask so they don't have to tell the truth. 
It's these politics, many ticks. Blood-sucking politicians where the only thing redder than their fangs is their blood-stained hands. Look at them elbow deep in the cookie jar. Let's call it capitalism. Who pays the tolls for the feudalism while the 10% prosper on bodies and profits while the race of us rest at the bottom and chains and body bags be placed much more than six feet deep amidst more fair trade agreements where the only thing fairly traded is our rage against this machine, a machine that will have us believe you will never be enough, you will never have enough. But see, enough is enough. Is enough, is enough, is enough, is enough, if we would just say it was enough. Enough. Baba stops me. I'm on a whirlwind, caught up in all of her words. And she says, baby, I want you to look in the water. What do you see? I think it's a trick question. Baba, I see me. It's like a mirror. She says, that's right, baby. You see you, water, your body, justice, love, are all one and the same thing. And if you cannot learn to love yourself, you cannot love anyone else. And if you cannot love anyone else, you cannot be justice because justice is what love looks like in public. So baby, learn to move like water. Learn to be like water. Learn to glue, groove like water over, around, or through a thing if you have to. But if you do anything, love yourself so you can love someone else. Because justice is just us. Being just us, without us there is no justice. Justice is just us, being just us, without us there is no justice. For all the ways we can get stuck in our heads about what equity is, it really is so simple as a story, as understanding who you are in it, as understanding what story you're living in and what stories other people are living in with you, and then choosing to be just us. Justice is a choice. So is living an equitable life, y'all. Justice is just us being just us. I encourage you this, this next two days to be like water. Move over, around, or through a thing which may very well be yourself and your own preconceived notions if you have to. Thank you, y'all. We will start with one from the overflow then. Okay. All right. What was the most powerful thing you took away from your mayoral campaign? 2017 will not leave me. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's true. People are like, ah, 2017. Um, most powerful thing. The importance of uh, community for anything. I mean, I feel like I already knew that, uh, but when we first decided we were going to run a candidate for Mayor of Seattle, and then when we decided it was going to be me, all of the campaign consultants were like, first of all, you're an activist, you're about to be a fringe candidate. No one's gonna listen to you. Um, and you're young and you're brown. So you'll be very lucky if you get 3% of the vote, that will be a successful campaign. And we walked away with, I think, 15.61%. And yeah, shout out to 15.61% of the voters in Seattle for doing a good thing. Um, but that was really only possible because of community community organizing, um, putting all of our attention on treating the campaign as a base and community building opportunity. Like we were not looking at it as an opportunity to get a seat, we were looking at it as an opportunity to build community power. And that made the campaign feel more like the voice of people, which then got to drive how it worked. Um, and so I feel like we've learned time and time again that uh, Community really is, community organizing, being authentic, really are the secrets to pretty much doing anything, but really having a transformative um, ca campaign for elected office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
You're not too much. They're too fragile. You're not too much. Um, so Seattle Pacific University when I got there was 4% students of color. Like all students of color, everybody. We were all on that 4%. So anytime I saw a brown person, you might see me run across campus like, hey, come to my club. <laughs> like I was known for chasing people down on campus. Like, you look lonely. I know I'm projecting. <laughs> um, and so uh, I would say my first organizing, my first experience organizing was on my college campus. Um, also, I feel like we've organized over Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Y'all might sauna be on it. <laughs> on all this stuff in the Pacific Northwest. I'd be like, dang. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, you're not too much. People are just very fragile. And in environments like an isolated college campus, uh, when people are calling you too much, it can feel like that is what you are because that can become the narrative on the campus. I survived Seattle Pacific University by finding all the other too much people. Everybody else who got called too much, that's my homie. Um, and we did a lot of great work together. Uh, sadly to say, only 50% of the too much people at SPU graduated because it was not a place that welcomed us in. Um, I will say, Almost 15 years later, they did use my image a lot and they're up to 23% students of color. <laughs> that sucks. Um, I mean, not the 23% part, but you know, my face on their stuff. Um, there's no easy answer for that. There's other than build community, find the other people who wanna disrupt and dismantle as much as you do and make it fun. One night we snuck into all the buildings, we put up on every wall, uh, Y'all are mad about affirmative action, but white people had it for 200 years. Y'all, I was extreme in undergrad. <laughs> um, and people went around campus tearing them off computer screens. Like, people were mad. They were crumpling them up, throwing them on the floor. You know, like, who would do this? And in the back of my mind, it was like, me. <laughs> and all the other folks that did it with me on campus walked around that whole day like, me. And there was just, there became a level of camaraderie that we found in knowing like, we're just gonna do this work. And because of that work, SPU definitely grew. Um, I'm an agitator. I accept that that is part of what I bring to the world. It doesn't mean it's not painful. It doesn't mean it's not isolating or marginalizing. Uh, it doesn't mean that I don't have, I mean, at the end of the campaign, every Friday night, I think I cried my eyes out every night. Every, every Friday night. By the time we got to the last month, there wasn't a night where I wasn't like, <laughs> I'm the candidate nobody likes. Um, I felt that my whole life. What makes it better is being in organizing communities. I'm with other radical people who want to see a radically transformed world. And when I look at the news and I see like cities all over the world right now, are, are rising up. We're about to reach the 20 year mark of WTO in Seattle. Sometimes it takes people willing to crack it open to make the change. And history has taught me those are the people that silently suffer the most. The most important thing we could do is in moments like this one, when you have space to be honest, is be honest because I guarantee you there's at least seven other people in the room who feel like you. If you're one of those other people who feel like that, please find Sana. Please, I would love to be at you. Go to BSU, you just got a public invite. <laughs> um, find each other. That was the other thing that may, has made things bearable is I also am the person who tends to break down in tears and spaces. So in law school, I was in a class where a prosecutor and a public defender were both teaching the class. And it was during 2015 when Black Lives Matter was at its climax. And um, <clears throat> we were talking about BLM in class and somebody just said like the most insensitive thing. And everybody looked at me like I was gonna lose my shit. And I cried. Embar to my embarrassment, I cried. Five people came up to me after class and were like, how can I get involved? 
and the next day we're in the streets protesting and serving as legal observers. And the person who said the thing that they said came up to me and like a week later and said, I had no idea how painful this was for people. So the other thing is, it's okay to be the person who cracks open the space. It's okay to be the person who sheds tears. Because again, I think there's probably five people that'll be changed by it and five other people who feel where you're at. So just keep being honest, keep being you. Um, yeah, take care, self-care, whatever that means to you. I think we'll take one more question. So I don't give in to hegemony. Um, I am a peacemaker. I think it's contextual. I always ask myself when somebody looks at me as the reasonable one, why they think I'm the reasonable one. And it's often because I'm the lightest skinned person in the room with the highest number of degrees um, dressed in the most businessy clothes. So I also think we have to be cognizant of when, when we use words like peace or peacemaker or threaten, sometimes people feel threatened not because I, 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 I don't yell at people, y'all. I literally will sometimes just say white supremacy and people are like, oh God. <laughs> so I think it's important to, I wanna put that in context first. Um, I'm hella light skinned for a black mixed person. And that comes with a whole lot of privileges. And there are a lot of times when I am the person in the room that I don't want to say I play peacemaker, I play translator. Um, I was in a legislative summit, uh, slummit, a legislative, it felt like a legislative slummit, <laughs> a legislative summit. I had Freudian slips tonight, man. Whew. Intersexting, I don't know what I was thinking. It was just, yeah, all right. Um, uh, there was a woman in the room. So this summit was supposed to be for people of color and they had put racial justice and criminal justice in the same room as if racial justice was not important to all people of color in every facet of everything we do. And there were people talking about important criminal legislative things that needed to be moved through, but we're doing it on the backs of black folks who were not going to benefit from that le legislative change. By that I mean, we will put laws in place that have a lot of compromises in them and it ends up helping people of color, but it's anti-black as fuck. Or even anti-native. And so <clears throat> this woman spoke up and was like, you know, the what you wanna push for sounds really important. It sounds like you don't have an analysis about anti-blackness and the impact it could have on black people. I don't want laws passed on the backs of black folks, but that don't benefit black people. And everybody in the room seemed like they were about to lose their mind. And I heard what she was saying. So I said, um, peace sis, do you mind if I try to help these folks understand where you're coming from? Because I agree. And she was like, that's cool because we know each other. And I ended up explaining to them what she was saying. What's wild is I used absolutely no different words. And all of a sudden, all the folks were like, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense, that's true, that's true. We need to have a different kind of race analysis for this particular thing. And I was like, yo, my sister here literally just said exactly what I said and you couldn't hear it because her, who she is as a black woman, as a dark skinned black woman made her voice sound louder. So then the next thing I needed to do was say what I just said to you. I encourage those of us who sometimes play peacemaker roles or in those positions to also be the ones who call out things because we are often the ones who have some kind of privilege in the space. And if we're not calling those things out, we're actually reifying the wall around justice. We are making it harder for those folks most distanced from justice who have the least amount of proximity to advocate for their self. My goal in everything that I do is to get to the place where the most impacted person gets to do the advocacy and solution building. I'm often not the most impacted person in the room. 
So if people are coming to me, it's probably because just by virtue of who I am, they feel less threatened by me and more threatened by someone else. And part of dismantling these systems that function on hegemony is to both help translate and for better or worse, be the person who says, no matter how you say it, is the person who says, what you just did was very racist and sexist and here's why. Um, and for me, that is a multifaceted peacemaking because I never would have wanted my sister in that room with me to feel like I left her behind or have any resentment towards me. In fact, I would rather the folks in a privileged position to feel some kind of way about me than her. Because at the end of the day, the person who's probably got, got my back right now in this moment is her. Um, so what I would encourage is be thoughtful. Always ask yourself about your analysis. Um, and if you find yourself always being the person in that, that bridge role, also be critical of it, be analytical of it, because sometimes that means that you're also the person those folks feel safe with, and there's a reason why they feel safe. Um, and as a black mixed person who has the degrees that I have, sometimes people feel safe with me. And it's okay for me to make them uncomfortable. That doesn't make me less safe. Um, and that's their fragility and not mine. Sorry that was a long answer, but. All right, I think that's time for us. Thank you so much, Nikita, again.